This is Pastor Richard, and you are watching Anchored in Christ, a vlog from St. Paul's Lutheran Church to know what we believe and why we believe it to be anchored in Christ's word for us. Now this week we are looking at 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. It is a very, very troubling story of David seeing another woman named Bathsheba, who is not his wife. In fact, she's even married herself. He lusts after her. He calls for her. They get together. They break that sixth commandment and she ends up conceiving and becomes pregnant. As a result of it, it doesn't stop there. David goes down this path of trying to cover his tracks, which ultimately ends up in the murdering of Bathsheba's husband named Uriah in order to, again, cover his tracks. You see, what's going on here is this, is the, the peculiar problem that we have for us as humans. We do not like to admit our sin. We do everything possible to manage the effects of sin when it is committed, when it's brought to our conscience. Now, I want to show you a really helpful sheet on this. And the sheet title is this, Mankind's Various Methods of Suppressing the Truth About Sin. You see, when it comes to sin, what we can end up doing is when that consciousness, consciousness of error comes to us, uh, our immediate reaction is we deny it. We say, you know, I didn't do it. We cast it off to the side. And if we can't cast it off to the side, then we end up doing this. It's a very interesting tactic. We blame others. We say, well, maybe that error did happen, but I'm not at fault because the devil and my friend or they or circumstances ended up making me do that sin. Again, we're trying to cast that blame, that consciousness of error off to the side. And if we can't do that, well, then we do something called legalism, legalizing our sin. We say we, it kind of goes like this. We, we embrace the sin. We say, yeah, I've done it, but at least I'm not as bad as those people over there. At least I'm not as bad as those other greater sins off in the distance uh, as a way to downplay the seriousness of our sin. And then another one, a couple more just real briefly to focus on. If we can't escape that uh, consciousness of error, then another thing that, that we end up doing is we end up trying to numb that error, sometimes through alcohol and drug abuse. Uh, there's a couple others here, just real briefly. Uh, we see works righteousness. Works righteousness. Uh, we, we don't necessarily repent of the sin, but we... Well, how, how is it? We, we basically try to do a bunch of good works almost as a scale. If we do more good works than the bad sin that we've had, that it'll pay for that. The point being all of these systems, all of these ways are us avoiding that consciousness of error, avoiding confessing that sin, uh, which is basically over here saying, I am a sinner that is clothed and covered by the grace of Jesus Christ. It's admitting our sin that we have sinned and thought word and deed, and then receiving that absolution, that forgiveness of Jesus for us. Now, the reason why I mention all of this is as we look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, this is what David is attempting to do. Excuse me, not David, but Nathan as a pastor to David. That is what Nathan is trying to do in chapter 12. He's trying to bring David to a confession of sin. Uh, really, this is the job of all pastors. It is to make sure and to try to bring people to own their sin. Uh, like that, uh, that tax collector who, who beats his chest and says, I, the sinner, I, me, I'm the one that has sinned. Because once we confess our sins, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to grant us this great righteousness, this absolution for all of our sins. So as we think about First Samuel, excuse me, Second Samuel chapters 11 and 12, we see definitely David sinning and his tactics of trying to cover up his sin, as well as from that sheet, all the different tactics that we do to manage our sin. And we need to realize that what needs to happen is that we need to be brought to repentance. That is confessing the sin ourselves, owning it 100% with no if, ands, or buts, no commas, no blaming, no denial, no substance abuse to numb the conscious, consciousness of error but to own it, to say, I have sinned and thought word and deed, exactly where Nathan brings David, so that, so that there can be absolution, the forgiveness of sins applied to that sin. Uh, one more thing, too, as we look through this section here, as we turn to Psalm 32, uh, scholars often point to Psalm 32 as this uh, psalm tied exactly to David's sin here. Let me just read to you exactly what happens here. Psalm 32 says this, uh, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, indeed, whose sin is covered. Indeed, there's an absolution. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts, counts no iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. Now get this, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up 
as by the heat of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. That's what happens when we end up managing our sin. Uh, our bones are, are wasting away. There's a groaning. There's a heaviness. All of these tactics suck a tremendous amount of energy from us trying to manage our sin. But there is freedom in simply owning our sin, confessing it before the Lord Almighty, confessing it on Sundays in the divine service, confessing it to a pastor, and then hearing that wonderful proclamation of the gospel, your sins are forgiven. Indeed, your sins are forgiven. So I hope that helps. And we'll catch you next time.